tough, practical and virtually indestructible. That's how Subaru describes this new Forest E-Boxer. But does it do enough to meet the demands of the everyday explorer? And can it claim the crown against other mid-size SUVs like the Toyota RAV4, Mazda CX-5 and a new VW Tiguan? Well, I'm Andre and we're about to find out. The original Forester was first introduced back in 1995 and sales began shortly after in 1997 around Japan and US, making it one of the first crossover SUVs to ever be manufactured. Throughout the years, it has received numerous awards and has been recognized by several motoring entities. And now, Subaru has given it its e-boxer technology in the hopes of bringing it an extra spark. So if this isn't the first review that you've watched on the Forest e-boxer and you already know that this is the car for you, then do click the link above to visit our website and browse our latest offers on the Forester family. And if you are like me and enjoy watching car content, then click the subscribe button to join our amazing community. Not much has changed when it comes to the design of this facelifted fifth generation model. However, I do like the shape of these front LED headlights that come integrated with daytime running lights that pull your attention towards this front grille. That has been slightly increased in size and where you can find the Subaru badge. And if you do go with our sport trim, you get this front bumper with these lovely red accents on it. At the side, you can spot these prominent creases that start on the front wheel arch and make their way towards the back. And since we are talking about wheels, as standard with XC trims, you get 17 inch alloy wheels. With a sport trim, these will be 18 inches and dark painted as standard. And if you go with XC premium, these will be the same color and size, but will be in a diamond cut shape. As standard, you get automatically folding and heated door mirrors. However, with our sport trim, these come in this lovely textured matte black finish. Subaru really wants to emphasize that the Forester isn't your typical just an SUV SUV. This is an off-road SUV SUV. Therefore, as standard, again, you get roof rails across all trims. However, with our sport trim, these are now in matte black with these lovely red accents. If we go with sport trims upwards, you get privacy glass on the rear, quarter and back windows. And with our sport trim, you also get these lovely side scuffs that match the front bumper. When it comes to colors, the Forester ships in a lovely white pearl color, which is perfect for, well, not off-roading for sure. But don't worry, because for an additional 600 pounds, you can choose from any of the other eight colors available to you. Let me know in the comments below which one is your favorite. In terms of dimensions, the Forester measures 4,640 millimeters in length, which is around 40 millimeters longer than the RAV4, making it the longest of the three rivals. When it comes to the width, it is the narrowest at 1,815 millimeters. And when it comes to its height, it measures 1,730 millimeters, which makes it about 40 millimeters taller than any of the other rivals. But considering that ground clearance, does that have an impact on interior space? Well, we'll find out during the interior section. The rear end adopts the no-nonsense approach that Subaru's been known for years. However, although simple, I do like the design of these rear tail lights, and you also get a lovely spoiler. Also, across all trims, you get a rear view camera as standard so that you can navigate into those tight parking spaces. And to complete the sporty look of our sport trim, we also get this rear bumper with these lovely red accents. But to be a workhorse, you can't just look like a workhorse. You need to carry like a workhorse. So what's the Forester's practicality like? Well, if you go with sport trims upwards, you're off to a great start because you get a power tailgate as standard. Sadly, due to the batteries that are placed underneath the boot floor, once opened, you only get around 509 litres of boot capacity, which is around 70 litres less than the RAV4 and around 10 litres less than the CX-5 and the Tiguan. But you can see that there's plenty of space here for your weekly shop, maybe fitting in a baby buggy or even your camping equipment. And considering the off-road nature of the Forester, there's no surprise that you can find lots of hooks and anchor points dotted around the boots here. And you also get a 12 volt socket in here. And there's also plenty of space 
underneath the boot floor. If you need to extend that space, you can always fold the seats that you can do via pulling these tabs here, one over there and one over there, or you can press these buttons and the seats will fly down in a 60-40 arrangement. Once folded, you get 1,730 litres of extended boot capacity and although sadly you can't fold them in a 40-20-40 arrangement, you also get your roof rails and you got a brake towing capacity of 1,830 kilograms. So the boot space here, although not class leading, it is practical as well as versatile. But I think it's about time we take the Forester for a spin and I would like you to have an unbiased opinion about the car. So I got Abby to take us for a spin. So Abby is the marketing manager at OSV and she's recently made the change to go fully electric with her new VW ID3 which we'll be reviewing very soon in the channel so if that's something you're interested in then do click the notification bell below to be notified when that video goes live. So the e-boxer lineup only comes shipped with one engine option which comprises a 2 litre petrol engine, a small electric motor which is fed by a small lithium ion battery. The system produces 148 horsepower and 194 newton meters of torque for a 0 to 62 time of 11.8 seconds. So it's not the fastest of the block, but how does that translate to what you're experiencing? You can definitely feel that when pulling out of junctions and off of roundabouts, it, it doesn't feel as quick as the block um, in its standard mode. However, once you put it in sport mode, it does make a massive difference. Um, it's certainly a lot more responsive, so I would, I would definitely recommend driving it in sport mode. When it comes to economy, I think it's really important to mention that this is a self-charging hybrid SUV. So don't expect amazing levels of electric only range. In fact, I think there's only about a mile here, but that's not the point of the electric motor. The electric motor is installed here just to assist that petrol engine. So for example, when taking off, you can expect the car to be utilizing that electric motor. But as soon as you start adding passengers and light loads, that motor will then transition into an assistive function. And if you just finish the food shop or just dropping some heavy cargo at a tip, then you can expect that petrol engine to be working on its own. The good thing about it is that the car shifts for all these modes automatically, so it's one less thing that you have to worry about. And Subaru has implemented all these modes in the hopes of improving fuel economy, which on paper is about 34.7 miles per gallon. And to be fair, it actually matches what we've got on the dashboard at the moment. But that is not great. So if you are looking for a self-charging hybrid SUV, we have reviewed quite a few, and you can watch my favorite one by clicking the pop-up banner above. When it comes to CO2 emissions, again, not the greatest because they do go as high as 185 grams of CO2 per kilometer, which sadly places this car straight to the highest BIK tax rate for 2023 to 2024. However, if we were to put all this practicality, versatility, towing capacity into a normal petrol on the engine SUV, you could definitely expect those figures to be a lot higher. But we digress, let's go back into the driving experience and talk a bit about the handling because Subaru has placed the engine symmetrically and quite low in the chassis in the hopes of helping with driving stability. So is that something that you notice or not really? Yeah, definitely. So it grips to the road really well. It takes corners really well. The steering is quite heavy, um, but that does fill you with confidence. So it makes it feel really sturdy as you're driving around. What about shifting gears? Obviously this is an automatic transmission, so shifting gears isn't really something that you need to be concerned about. But how do those transitions feel? In sport mode, you can't feel them. It's a really smooth transition through the gears. Whereas in standard, that's when I really noticed it. So you can really feel the car pulling as it gets to the maximum of that particular gear before it changes, it really maximizes each gear before it makes that change. The reason I ask is because Subaru has implemented quite a lot of tech into this electronic transmission and where opposed to a normal conventional transmission whereby every time you press the clutch you lose power and traction, here the, that power is continuously delivered to every single wheel to ensure that efficiency. Obviously if you've got the car in intelligent mode it does tend to hold on to those gears a bit longer just to maximize that fuel efficiency. We briefly talked about the two tarmac modes, which are intelligent mode and sport mode. 
As standard, the car will start itself in intelligent mode, which does maximize fuel efficiency at a cost of drivability. If you do want to reverse things, you can put the car in sport mode, and that will optimize drivability whilst sacrificing fuel efficiency. There's also another two modes, two all-terrain modes, which are dirt and snow, and deep snow and mud. Dirt and snow are for those circumstances where you are about to go onto a slippery surface, i.e. something covered in dirt or sand, and the deep snow and mud mode is for those situations where you can feel the car about to get stuck and you want to make sure that you don't end up in that situation. So as expected, Subaru installed quite a rigid suspension here, obviously to make sure that it could handle all kinds of terrains. But do you feel that that rigidity impacts the car on normal roads like this one and going over speed bumps like we are now? No, I think it's actually all right. It's fine, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's actually fine. I was expecting it to be a little bit more solid, like... A bit more severe. Yeah, but not at all. It actually it's actually out, smooth them out, yeah, really nicely. So what are your thoughts on noise and vibration? I'd say that the noise levels are okay. So wind noise, you can't really hear. It's a windy day today and we've had no problems with that, which is brilliant. Um, you can hear a bit of a vibration. So as you're going over lumps and bumps in the road, you can hear the vibration. Um, and there's, there's almost a bit of a rattling throughout the cabin. Um, and then noise in terms of the gear changing in intelligent mode you can hear that um, you can really hear it revving as it gets to the top of that gear and um, before it changes over um, but in sport mode it's a pretty quiet smooth drive other than the rattling or the vibration in the cabin so I'm not sure about you but one of the things that I've noticed straight away when we sat in the car was the amount of screens you have so you've got your screen behind your wheel you've got your infotainment screen and you've got that screen on top of the dashboard um, how are you finding all this information bombarded at you at one time for some people having all this information readily available shown on the screens is probably a really good thing um, but for somebody like me I'm not too fussed about it it just looks like a lot of numbers and a lot of information that I don't really need to know when I'm driving from A to B. So we've mentioned when we first hopped in the Forester that you currently drive the ID3, which is a smaller, more compact family car. Do you find that with this higher driving position, you have a better view of what's ahead of you? Yeah, you, you can see a lot more. You're a lot higher up. Um, so you've got really good visibility of the road ahead. You've also got really thin pillars, so it doesn't obstruct your view. What about that back window? Because it, it looks massive from here. It is. You've got really great view through the back window. And also the back windows are really large as well. So you can see everything you can do out of those two. So I'd say all round the vis visibility in the Forester is pretty good. When it comes to safety, Subaru has really invested a lot of their efforts into making the Forester as safe as it could be. I mean, they've done changes to the cage, they've implemented features such as hill start assist, traffic alert, hazard avoidance. I mean, there's so many features here, and if these are important to you, you can always discuss them further with one of our vehicle specialists, and all you have to do to do that is ring our number, which is 01903 538 835, and they'll be more than happy to go through those with you. So it's no surprise that this car actually obtained a five-star Euro NCAP rating, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with Subaru's vision to eliminate traffic accident deaths involving their cars by 2030. When it comes to warranty, the Forester comes with three years or 60,000 miles and an eight-year warranty for that small battery. This is roughly the same as many manufacturers across the UK, but sadly not as class-leading as Kia's seven-year warranty. So a standard with all Forester trims, you do get a rear view camera, but you also get a side view camera, which is displayed in a multi-information screen up there. Do you think that they are both useful or would you not worry so much about the top one? So the side view camera at the top, I don't feel of great benefit. And for me, I can only look at one camera at a time. So I focus on the rear view camera. So as I'm reversing into the space, I'm using the lines to line it up with the space and see where I'm actually steering. So for me, that 
that camera isn't all that useful. Um, but that could be because I'm not used to using a camera like that. I don't have that in my vehicle, so I'm only used to the rear view camera. So I would focus mainly on that. So the first thing you'll notice as soon as you hop into Forrester's front cabin is that even though Subaru went for that no-nonsense approach, you still have a lot of material variety here and quality because you do get this nicely leather-wrapped steering wheel. You also get a nice leather effect on top of the doors here, hard robust plastics on top of the dash and on the side here you got your chrome edging around your door handles and window controls you have this nice fabric effect on the door here and you obviously get your gloss black materials around the infotainment screen climate controls and gear lever at six foot i'm about four inches of the top of the roof lining there and that's considering the fact that i've set myself to the highest seating position leg room not too bad either and even though this car is the narrowest when compared to those three contestants there's still a wide space here for you to have a front passenger without it feeling too cluttered and even though Subaru was marketed the Forester as this off-road SUV there's still plenty of comfort available to you Seats are heated and electrically adjustable as standard so you can move yourself in a number of different ways Sadly, it doesn't come with lumbar support, but to make up for that, you do get a memory function. So even when someone else takes your car out, as soon as you hop back in, you can press that button and it will go back into your preferred driving position. Another cool feature with the Forester is that you get these two sensors and they are able to identify up to five different drivers. So as soon as you set your profile with all your climate controls, your driving position, wing mirror position, it will then identify your face and make the changes automatically so that you're always driving with your perfect settings. As standard with XE trims, the seats will come upholstered in a black fabric material. Our sport trim adds red and orange stitching and if you go for the XE premium trim, you'll get black leather seats. The steering wheel is manually adjustable so you can move it backwards, forwards, up and down. It is also wrapped in leather across all trims but our sport trim adds orange stitching and this nice accent at the bottom here. It is a multi-function steering wheel so you get your basic media and driving controls right where you need them. Behind the wheel you get a little LCD display that shows you basic driving information such as your current speed, driving mode, consumption and mileage. But as we mentioned in the driving section, you do have another two screens here. And that's our main infotainment display that goes from seven inches to eight inches with sport trims upwards. And you get your 6.3 inch multi-information display. Now that multi-information display only shows you your climate controls and your driving modes and other manufacturers do put them above the climate controls down here. So I can see Subaru's trainer thought in putting it in your line of sight, but is it really necessary to have another screen for that purpose? Let me know in the comments below. This central display, however, it's sharp. The icons are nice and large, it's responsive. You got access to your apps such as your DAB radio, your phone connectivity, your settings, your navigation. But as you know, using this while on the go, it's not the most efficient way of doing things. So Subaru has included physical shortcut buttons so you can jump from your apps to your maps to your radio and if you do want to take things a step further you can use voice commands show map showing map underneath the infotainment display you do get access to your physical climate controls and i'm glad to see that they have not been incorporated into the central display because that's quite tricky to use while on the go another thing the multi-information display here has gesture control so if you want to raise the temperature, you just open your hand, and if you want to decrease it, you just close your fist. As you can see, Subaru has implemented a lot of features into the Forester here to prevent you from taking your eyes off the road. And these are not just a gimmick though, they do work quite well. Underneath the display, you do get a little cubby for your phone, which fits my iPhone 13 perfectly. However, considering the size of smartphones nowadays, I don't think you could fit many down there. But you do get an auxiliary port, two USB-A ports, one for charging, one for mirroring, because you do get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as standard, and you also get a 12-volt socket. Then you get your automatic gear lever, you get a dedicated button for your side view camera. You also have your buttons for the heated seat functionality, your all-terrain driving mode knob, and your electronic 
parking brake. When it comes to cubby holes in the front here, you've got these two cup holders, which are perfect for one of these smaller flasks. However, you can see it's uh, not the most secure fit. You can remove this middle bit in the hopes of fitting a bigger bottle in there. Behind that, you have a little space for your car keys because there's no way a new smartphone can fit in there. If you open the armrests, you have a little tray for your coins. And it, oh, it does go quite far. Look, if I put my iPad in there, done. And you can also charge it because you also get another 12 volt socket in there. Door bins, still only big enough to fit a smaller flask like that and some paperwork. And the glove box, I mean, it is spacious, you know, considering we've got a massive log book in there. So I don't think you can fit anything else, really. And the first thing to mention here is how wide these doors open, making it perfect to load in a car seat or any other things into this rear space. In the back, you'll find the same amount of material quality and variety. In terms of space, I've got plenty of leg room. Headroom, you probably won't see it, but I've got about four inches above my head, so space isn't too bad. And if you were to put about three people in the back here, I mean, the middle person wouldn't be very comfortable because of the, the central tunnel there. But for short journeys, it's basically what you need. When it comes to niceties on the back here, you get not one, not two, but three different pocket sizes on the back of these seats. One that's big enough for a laptop or a magazine, another one that can easily store your phone, and another one perfect for your small tablet. If you fall down this middle compartment here, you are greeted with two cup holders, which are perfect for a small flask like this one. However, as you can see, it is slightly wobbly, so if you're going off-roading somewhere, this is not gonna work. So I suggest you put this in the door bin, which is quite smaller than the one in the front, but still perfect for a small flask like that. In the middle here, you get two air vents, but you can only control the intensity, not the temperature, so you're at the mercy of whoever is in the front. And you also get two USB-A ports, but for some reason they're behind this weird flappy plastic bit. Also, if you go with sport trims upwards, you get heated back seats. And since we're talking about trims, let's talk about pricing. XC trims start from £37,895, and with that you get a 7-inch touchscreen, a rear view camera, and a side view camera, so that you don't scuff your 17-inch alloy wheels. Our sport trim here starts from £39,985 and you get these lovely sporty accents, satellite navigation and heated rear seats. And finally, XC Premium trim starts from £40,895 and you get a sunroof, black leather seats and a bar opening tailgate. There's also a variety of packs and accessories so that you can fully customize your Forester. So if that's something you'd like to discuss further, then do click the link below. So should you buy, lease or finance the new Forester e-boxer? Well, I was really impressed with the quality of the interior and the amount of space you get considering background clearance. Even though a bit controversial, I do love this exterior design because it does resemble an off-roadier X3. And if you are someone that takes safety very seriously, which you should, then this car packs in a lot of those safety features. When it comes to my nitpicks on a Forester, I do think that that boot capacity could be slightly improved. Also, even though we've got that e-boxer system to improve fuel economy, those figures aren't that great. And sadly, drivability, especially in that intelligent mode, isn't the greatest either. But overall, I do think that the Forester is a great package. And if you are ready to go for your options with one of our vehicle specialists, then do feel free to give us a call on 01903 538 835. Alternatively, you can always visit our website and browse the latest offers we've got on the Forester family. But that's everything from me today. If you enjoyed this review, do give it a like, subscribe to our channel to be part of this amazing community. And if you are interested in car content, do click that notification bell because it will notify you when our next review comes out. But that was all. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.